Welcome everybody to Real Egg Live. I'm Sean Haney, your host for today's episode as usual. Thanks a lot for joining us. Hope you're having a good time out in the field and you're getting getting done what you need to get done. Uh, today we are going to be talking to entomologist Scott Mears. Uh, Scott recently retired from the Alberta government and he is now out on his own and his company is Mayland Egg Consulting. Hey Scott, how's it going? Real good. Yeah, Real good. so Great to uh, great to have you join us, and uh, just so everybody knows, it's not an error. Uh, Scott's out scouting fields today, so we're talking to him while he is out in uh, out in a field somewhere in Alberta, and uh, he's joining us over the phone today. So, hey Scott, as you're looking at some of the fields, I, I'm sure you were seeing some early early insect feeding. A lot of people talking about flea beetles. What have you been seeing? Yeah, there's uh, some some reports of heavy pressure. The the farms I'm working with, uh, no need to spray. That's Youngstown, Acadia Valley country. But I've heard uh, some heavy pressures actually south into the Lomond country and down in there. So, so yeah, it is that time of year, and and they're out and they're active. We've had lots of nice warm days. So. They're out there doing their thing. Yeah, and like out in Manitoba, they had some frost over the weekend. It's sort of a repetition of last year where that that crop growth has just stunted a little bit here at the early stages, and it really gives the flea beetles an opportunity to feed. Yeah, you know, more often than not, not always, but more often than not, it's not the it's not the big populations. It's the crop not doing well that that causes us to need to spray now. You know, there are situations where the populations are that high, but for the most part, canola, our new hybrid canolas grow so vigorously that they, they tend to outgrow flea beetle damage pretty readily. Um, so, you know, last year, Alberta, we had lots of, especially southern Alberta, dry early and the crops just sat, did nothing that we got into some flea beetle issues over that. And then, you know, anything that holds the crop back and allows the flea beetles to to get the upper hand. If you have a question for Scott Mears today related to bugs, make sure you uh, get it into the comment section, whether you're watching on Twitter, Facebook, or YouTube. So Scott, how do we evaluate whether or not we need to spray for flea beetles? What are some of those cues or those, uh, when, when we're out scouting, you know, they're jumping around, they're hopping around. How do we actually evaluate whether or not we need to control them? Yeah. So number number one is how much how much actual feeding damage is there. The threshold is is pegged at 25 percent cotyledon damage. There's some really nice uh, canola council has nice guides on what does 25 percent look like. I really like the one on Manitoba Ag site where it has. Uh, gradations from 5% damage up to 100% damage. So you can see where you are on that scale. Uh, we tend to overestimate. 25% uh, cotyledon damage or leaf damage is a lot. Um, it looks it looks really rough. So, uh, and really even at 25% cotyledon damage, we're not losing yield until we get closer to 50%. But we use 25% as a as a uh, go point because often it happens so quick. So number one, the, uh, the cotyledon and uh, first and second, third leaf damage. Usually by the time we're a fourth leaf, we're out of the woods. Um, the other thing is how active are the flea beetles? Uh, are you seeing lots of flea beetles? Are they jumping around? Um, and then past that, what's your crop like? Uh, are you what's your plant stands like? How's your how's your crop performing? Is it is it actively growing or is it kind of sitting there? Because that plays into the into the um, the mix as well. But the threshold is twenty five percent. That's the point at which uh, spray recommendations start. So is the thought process the thicker the stand I have, the least likely I am to have to to spray because I've got I've got a I've got a number of plants I guess I could lose in my stand if I needed to. Yeah, there's a couple parts to that question first is um it's just dilution the, the the more plants you have you have the same number of flea beetles but if you have twice as many plants you have half as much damage it's just simple dilution um the second part is sometimes the flea beetles especially if we've had nice weather and then it gets cold and rainy or really windy like we've had in southern alberta 
especially the striped pleavedils will go down and feed on the stems. Mm. And stem feeding, then you need to know your plant populations. Um, if you're if you're close to to your minimum plant populations, and you start getting stem feeding, and you can't stand to lose any. So you need to understand your plant population on top of what's happening. Um, with the flea beetle damage to the cotyledons and to the stem feeding. And, and um, we've seen a lot more spraying for stem feeding since uh, the striped flea, do- flea beetles become more more predominant. What's up with seed treatments? I, they, have they lost their effectiveness or what's going on here? No, I, I think I think we're in this perfect storm where we, where we uh, uh, were seeding earlier and earlier with our canola. Uh, we've got a shift to uh, to striped flea beetles, which come out earlier than than the crucifer, the, the all black ones. And the third thing is, is what's what's your major crop input uh, for canola? It's the seed. So producers are seeding less and less seed. And if anything happens where you get um, thin plant stands, like half of the plants don't come up instead of. 70% coming up, you get 50% coming up, then you're short of plants all of a sudden, and then the flea beetles um, start to get an upper hand. So the, the chemistries are working for what they, they've they always done, but we've put more pressure on on, on them because the, the flea, beetle, flea beetles are there and we have fewer plants and, and we're, we're plants more under stress because they're earlier. So it's just a perfect storm for, for flea beetles. Yeah, if you have a question for Scott, make sure you ask it in the comment box below, and I'll get to as many of them as I can. I got a text message here from a farmer in southern Alberta. Kevin asks, why are, why does it seem that wire worms are way worse this year? Um, because I think wire worms are, are a building population. Um, I, I've been working a bit on wire worms with uh, with uh, some of the Ag Canada researchers this year, and uh, yeah, there's there's a lot of them this year. So why they seem worse, I'm not sure. Um, maybe finally we have a nice vigorous crop there, and there's something to eat, and so they're they're in there feeding. But yeah, it, I, I agree. I think Southern Alberta is seeing more wire worm issues this year than we've seen in in previous years. What, what are my action steps? You know, a lot of time, you know, if you know you have wireworms, you, you know you have to use some of the, the higher end seed treatment products that, that are out there to control them. If I didn't do that, what steps can I take? Oh, um, once the seed's in the ground, there's not a whole lot we can, we can do. Fingers crossed. You, That's uh, what you do. <laughs> fingers crossed. Yeah. Yeah. I hope you don't have to reseed. Um, no, once there's nothing we can do once the crops in the ground. It's 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 seed treatments. It's um, you know all those things we always say, but it's hard to get them all to line up. Seed um, as shallow as possible in a firm, moist seed bed. Right? How many times have you heard that? But with wireworms, it's critical to first seed treat and then get your crop growing as fast as you can. Because uh, the less time it spends getting established, the less damage that wireworms can do. Because once once the crop's established, they, they don't take out as many plants. It's it's we lose most of the plants in that prior to the two to three leaf stage. Most of them actually lose just as the crops come in out of the ground. So uh, Real Ag's Lara asks, uh, could it be due to a buildup of population in combination with their multi-year larval stage? Well, uh, certainly we see a buildup um, over over the years. Um, I, I I don't know how to how to take that question particularly. I guess. Okay. I think what what's what's happening is is we're seeing a building population, and and um, you know maybe I, I don't know I don't know why this year. I I've I've heard lots of producers this year say they're seeing way worse wireworm pressure when they come out of a pulse into into a cereal. Um, so that's that's an interesting comment. Uh, maybe they don't like the pulses as well, and they're sitting there waiting for the cereal when it comes out. Wireworms only lay eggs in cereals, by the way. So that's that's the year, this, your cereal years are when the population is replenished by egg laying and new, 
new wire rim uh, hatch. Yeah, and is that gr- building population across a building geography as well, or is it staying contained within the same geography? Mm, I'm hearing more and more reports north of Highway 1 now. Uh, uh, maybe not at the same levels of, of damage, but certainly I, the, the wireworm geography, at least in Alberta, is, is expanding north uh, a bit slower but it is expanding yeah. north there, there's some horrendous problems in foremost and willow creek um you know over into vulcan county there's some just horrendous problems where producers are really really fighting it i'm not really on top of the saskatchewan situation but okay. uh, i would i don't see why it would be any different mostly those brown and 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 um light brown and brown soil stones. Okay. Well, leading up into today's show, I got a number of uh, texts from people about pea leaf weevils. What what can you tell us uh, about those populations? Um, I actually had a, a, a conversation this morning via text with my former technician, and she's in the middle of, of her survey. So if you have pea fields north of Highway 1, uh, she's looking for fields. Um, but generally, it sounds like uh, pea leaf weevil numbers are still quite low. So her, her comment to me was really low numbers so far, only a few fields that would be approaching what we would consider a threshold. And, and does that does that surprise? I detect some surprise in your voice a little bit, or is that just... <laughs> I don't know if it's a surprise. I, I, I kind of thought that we would start to see a rebound in population, but the population in southern Alberta has been lower than, you know, we had peaks 10 years ago, and, and the last three or four years has been low, and it doesn't seem to be recovering, and I'm not right. sure why. Okay, so, okay. Yeah. It uh, might might be wet with the weather. I don't know. Okay. But, yeah. Uh, we don't have terribly dry weather in in parts of western canada this year uh what does it mean for grasshoppers um too early uh actually to get a good read grasshoppers will just be emerging now so um it'd be nice to get a good hatch and then some 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 of those good old-fashioned monsoon rains that we had in the early 2000s that that's really why we've had really low populations in southern Alberta for many many years, but mm. um, the weather we've had right now is actually probably nearly ideal for grasshoppers. A little bit of rain, but not soaking wet. Um, so, yeah, um, populations of grasshoppers have been building through southern Alberta the last while. Uh, we have. We kind of have a biennial outbreak in in the peace in northern central Alberta, and the bulk of central Alberta has been is low grasshopper risk for for right now anyway. Yeah, so yeah, and, and that's and, what we're looking at. Yeah, in parts of Alberta, like you know, you look around the Edmonton area, just or Camros even. There's areas that are just getting pummeled by rain. It, it seems that yeah. My, my guess is is that does now at this point in time in the year. Does that lessen our our concern about insects insects going forward, or how does that how does that wet weather impact our outlook? Uh, so some insects don't like rain, and some do. So if the grasshoppers are out, uh, those those heavy rains are really bad for grasshoppers and really good for the farmers as far as grasshoppers are concerned. But when we get into the wet cycle, we tend to get more wheat midge. So. Um, things, uh, things, we trade one for the other, I guess. And some of those those trades are not in our favor. (laughs) Not always. No, (laughs) no. You you, you think you're you're thinking Edmonton oil or GM making those trades. (laughs) You never win them. You never win them. Well, as a Flames fan, I'm not going to argue. I'm, I'm cool with it, man. Just, I'm just going to run with it. Well, I'm an Oilers fan and I I think we always lose on them, so. I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, well, if we could yeah. trade for some beneficials, I, I would take that trade. That That's a good insect trade. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so yeah. 
what's happening with beneficials um you know cutworm numbers i have not heard anybody talk about cutworms this year and it's probably beneficials that are holding them back but touch early um we should if, if there are cutworms out there they should start showing up now um i know we we just drove across the section of canola this morning uh checking it very carefully and didn't see a single wilted plant and so I, I don't know i this is the time of year to check for them uh always be suspicious of those bare areas in the field always check them it, on the because hills is that could be typically on the hills although i have seen cutworms in low spots uh yeah when i saw them in low spots there's always fall work land where where the cutworms laid eggs, eggs in this in the loose soil so cutworms are a very uh, like there's five species and each one has its own little niche and yeah. southern alberta pale pale western like that loose soil so sandy soils or soils that were worked in the fall or um redback in southern alberta tend to like the um tend to like the uh the pulse double where in central alberta we tend to get red back on on uh, wheat stubble for some reason and then causing trouble in canola the next year so it, it, scott if we yeah. have to spray for flea beetles or cutworms is there a certain time of the day that we should be doing that not particularly um cutworms we always talk about spraying more towards evening because they're more active in the evening so it um but flea beetles uh, they're in the field you just go out and get good coverage and get them treated i would tend to spray them in the morning actually more but mm. if, if you had a choice sometimes you don't get a choice yeah. but um uh, cutworms more in the evening i guess um yeah depends on the product you're using too there's you know there's substantial differences in the products for cutworms now so you know some of the some of the newer newer insecticides are, are more systemic and it doesn't matter particularly when you spray them uh got a t got a message here through twitter scott i had not added insecticide to my chickpeas this year i found a lot of damage lately okay insecticide as on seeds or uh, what? What I'm Must not be sure. Seed treatment. Doesn't say. Yeah. Okay. I would assume he's talking seed treatment, and I'm not sure what kind of damage it would probably be wireworm because uh, pea leaf weevil doesn't uh, doesn't attack uh, chickpea, so I I'm not sure what he's referring to. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, well, it's one of those things where, and maybe we'll get a follow-up message on, on the specifics of it, but it's sort of like we were talking okay. before we, we started, uh, the bra, oh, here, I got more here. Heavy straw trash area were the worst areas. Some chickpeas up to three new stems eaten. Yes. With, and I'm still waiting for more. Oh, it's gotta be cutworms. He's talking cutworms. Ah, uh, okay. It's gotta be cutworms. Yeah. So that, 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 yeah. So pulses have this thing where cutworms cut them off and then they'll re sprout from down by the seed so they have below ground nodes and and that's probably what he's talking about okay um it, it, you know if he's if he's really struggling he can maybe get a you know like a corrigin treatment on there yeah he uh, can, he confirmed yes yeah. cutworms yes yeah so Though, you know, our, our neonics don't do anything, so our traditional seed treatments don't do anything for cutworms. Um, you'd have to be going to some of the new diamond uh, style, the new seed treatments to pick up cutworms. Or, you know, uh, in those areas where he's having troubles, a spray of corrigin might, might clean them up. So, interesting. That's the first cutworm report I've heard this year. There you go. You heard it here on Real Ag Live. Look at that. Yeah, exactly. Making, Live, making news, making news. Uh, <laughs> I got another text here about the murder hornet, which is something that uh, if anybody's been watching the news, uh, I don't know, about a month ago, there was all this uh, concern and 
discussion about how there were these Asian large size hornets that were going to kill all of us. What are your, mm. what are your thoughts on this? Seems a bit of an overblown story. I think the story is overblown. Uh, I, I think it's more of an issue in the milder parts of Canada. Um, I don't think they're going to do very well in our, our winters, but the reports are all out of BC, if I understand correctly and on, on the Island, Washington and state, Washington, some of Washington state. Okay. Again, a, a milder part of the world. Um, yeah, I, I know CFIA is working very hard on tracking down and, and eliminating those, the hives or the, uh, colonies on the, on the BC Island, uh, Vancouver Island. I don't expect that there'll be a big deal in Alberta. So yeah. that's that's where I'm at on it. Yeah. Uh what about leaf hoppers? Um, you know, I've been watching some headlands and I'm not seeing he- leaf hoppers yet this year. So that's good news. Um I, I am working with a, a carrot grower and I, I have some sticky cards out which I will see on Thursday, so I could answer you on Thursday. Okay. But, and I'm not not seeing them on headlands. If you walk headlands and watch for them, I'm just not seeing leaf hoppers. Hmm. Oh, so, yeah, um, that's good. Yeah, no kidding. I like this. Uh, I this is. Yeah. I, I would say if we tallied this up so far, we're we're to the positive of not worrying about some of these bugs in comparison to the ones we are. What do you think? Generally, generally pretty good. Yes, yeah. yes, and you know I'm I. I don't, I'm going to be really interested. There's there's a number of trials out on new wireworm control products. And I'm going to be fascinated to see how they look. I've seen there's trials set out on at least two different species that I know of. So, or you know, where we know the predominant species are different. So I'm I'm really looking forward to seeing how how those products work. And some of the companies are starting to get pretty excited about them. So, a couple of years down the road, but. I think there's the better answers coming. And, and what kind of, th- what are you hearing in terms of control and what, what would that like, just, can you give us a bit of a sneak peek into that a little bit? Yeah. Like control, like killing wireworms, not, not just making them sick. Not so stunning, that's, not that's, stunning them. Like going back to like what we had when we had dual. Uh, going back to Lindane type control. That's, really? that's the word. Um, it's, it's not, it's not the dime. It's, it's a whole nother class of, of insecticides. So uh, I we'll see, right? We'll see. But yeah. um it looks promising. Well, that's good. That's uh, you know I maybe I'll get to go to some summer tours this year and not have them be running around counting bugs all the time. <laughs> there you go. Hey, wh- what's your forecast on the uh, cabbage seed pod weevil? Oof, good good one. Uh, it, it's been down the last couple of years although last year is a little more normal. It's uh, like a little less dry last year. I think cabbage seed pod weevil should be up a little bit this year, but uh, I don't think it's it's going to take a couple of years for those populations to really fully ex- rebound. So um, that's that's my read. There'll be some spraying, but uh, I don't think it's going to be like killer populations we've seen in the past. Yeah, like there was a couple of years there where that was like that was the insect, the predator for canola. There was, you know, that's everybody talked about oh, it. That, you know yeah. what I mean? Like it was just, but we're, we're we went kind of through a bit of a down cycle here. What what caused that? Yeah. Well, I I don't know exactly. It, you know, we've we've been in a low cycle, and I'm I'm suspicious that these really really dry years have been hard on that insect. Um, if if you look, if you follow the biology of, of cabbage seed pod weevil, they they drop to the soil and pupate in the soil. And if it's smoking hot and dry, I think you're getting high population uh, kill by just, you know, the, the larvae frying before they can pupate. So I think that's maybe what's happening. I'm just, it's totally surmising, but it sure follows the, the decrease in cabbage seed pod weevil in southern Alberta just follows the drought. So we'll see. We get to come out of the drought if cabbage seed pod weevil comes back. I suspect it will. Is there another insect that you are following very, very closely here, or you are? It's definitely on. You think that needs to be on the minds of growers in a, with the conditions that we have on the prairies here in, in 2020. I, I I like that it rains and and we if we have to spray then it doesn't hurt so much. 
because we're protecting a, a real crop. Um, n- nothing else. I think we, I think we've hit most of them. Um, I've been. Oh, the one thing, if you if you look at the Alberta uh, pest monitoring site, there was an early flight of of um, diamondback moth this year. So that's going to be one to watch. So I, I would really encourage producers and agronomists to be watching canola as it comes into flower. You do your sweeps for cabbage seed pod weevil anyway. Just watch diamondback moth numbers because I that early flight usually means that we're setting up for a potential problem. Okay, and the pr- just give us the timing of that. It would most likely be when in the growth cycle. So for diamondback moth, it, we don't. If we have to spray them, it's it's after flowering. Okay. So but a... but we we can, we can get a read at flowering how many there are are in in the sweep nets when we're watching for cabbage seed pod weevil. So yeah, right. but after, that one's that one's a ways off. But got, that's, that's for... one we haven't seen for anyway. Yeah, okay. go ahead. Well, I noticed you didn't say, yeah. is it the cicadas? Is that whatever, the 17-year burial of these cicadas everyone's worried about in the Carolinas? Have you been following that? Um, yeah, that's the Carolinas. We don't have the 17-year cicada. <laughs> Thank we actually goodness. We have very few cicadas. Yeah, yeah. Locusts? Now, we're not worried about locusts? But... We're not worried about them coming in and no. stealing our crop? No, the, the, the massive, massive outbreak of locusts in, in Africa, but no. We okay. don't, they're not having no. Well, that's, I'm a. We come as grasshoppers. Uh, grasshoppers, yeah. There, there's years yeah. where it feels like the locusts are here with all the grasshoppers that we have, and, and uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, I I managed to managed to uh, retire before we got another big outbreak of grasshoppers because that is, I think, the most diff- one of the most difficult insect problems to deal with because they just keep coming. When when we get in the big outbreaks, that, that's that's a really disheartening problem yeah like it, it's different than say flea beetles right where once we get to a certain right. growth stage we're past it we're past them and we can worry about other things but it's, it's just that case of getting yeah. past them or getting getting you know enough growth in the in the field with grasshoppers yeah. it's just it feels like it's just devastation spray devastation spray like it's it just it's yeah. a cycle that just keeps repeating itself yeah you don't seem to be able to get on top of them and you can't you can't uh, can't spray your way out of it. I don't think you can try to protect your crop, but at some point you're just gonna throw up your hands and maybe go to the lake or something. Yeah. Well, Scott, you know, I've I got you here. I got to make sure I mention our Pest and Predator podcast that we launched at realagriculture.com. It is brought to you by Field Heroes, powered by the Western Grains Research Foundation. You can find all the episodes at fieldheroes.ca or realagriculture. Dot com. I Scott, I've I've learned so much about about beneficials in that podcast. I'm looking my favorite conversation that hasn't been released yet, and I've I've actually used it as a you know when you're having beers with some friends is the whole issue with the break on Cephi. Like there's an example of something that oh. I learned from you, and uh, very very cool stuff. I, I just think that we're not. Th- this is a good opportunity to learn more about what's happening inside that canopy, especially when we're thinking about spraying insecticides. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Uh, the, the decision to spray insecticide carries a lot more costs than the insecticide itself. It, like, we often are killing things that are helping us. Not often, we always are. So we have to we have to take the threshold seriously and not spray uh, when we don't have to. Yeah, for sure. Uh, tomorrow's guest on yeah. Real Ag Live will be Deb Campbell. We'll be talking Eastern Canadian agronomy, corn and beans and wheat. So please join us at 3 p.m. Eastern. We've been talking to Scott Mears of Mayland Ag Consulting. Thanks, everybody, for your questions and good luck out there in the field. Hey, Scott, I really appreciate it. We're done and you can get back to your crop scouting. All right. Have a good day. <laughs> Cheers. Thanks, everybody, for getting real and getting connected with Real Ag Live. And we'll chat again tomorrow. Cheers, everybody.